and welcome everybody to day three. We're at our midway point. Hey, um, I wanted to do a quick recap so far of um, not only what we've heard from you, but also in terms of the um, what we've gone over over the past few days. And so um, in terms of our journey together so far, um, we've heard the recognition of the importance of information to help guide these funding decisions um, from catalogs of available services. And I know there's a number of different efforts. Um, our team has shared out our version of that catalog of open infrastructure services and plans moving forward. Um, we talked about different funding data uh, challenges, but also insights that our team has put together um, and also the need for additional information around current funding levels both in terms of the landscape as well as on a specific service provider um, service provider level as well, as well as the need for research into gaps that we could address with additional resourcing. And we'll be talking about some of our work in that space today and how that has um, how that has influenced our co-budget experience, which we'll be speaking about in a, in a few minutes. We also heard about the desire for those uh, for additional clarity about how those pieces can work together and what does that look like when it's integrated in terms of the information about the services, the information about the funding, and um, also research into gaps and to how that influences the funding decisions. Um, and as we build out for these next few days, we'll be starting to stitch that together. We also heard interest in further participation and conversation uh, regarding yesterday's announcement of launching a collective fund um, from IOI in early 2024. Uh, we'll be talking more about those next steps as well as providing opportunities for you to register interest to join our Community Investment Council, which um, is part of the um, governance that we're thinking of for this collective fund and really turning that uh, model on its head of who gets to help make those decisions and also to help us further scope that work. Um, but registering, you know, that there was a really robust conversation yesterday around additional places for clarity and um, additional dimensions of um, this work that we would like to further explore both within the course of the summit and also over the coming months. Um, and thank you for those comments. And then also a desire for additional context on how funds will help support individual services. Uh, we know that there is, in many cases, very urgent needs for open infrastructure projects on their own and those providers as they continue to um, deliver service and value to the research community. Uh, but also additional context around incentives for key stakeholder groups to participate in a collective funding experiment, as well as the broader collective fund that we're building towards through 2024, and how our work sits alongside other initiatives that are also working to help support the broader open source ecosystem, scholarly communications ecosystem, and open um, tools for, for research and for um, open knowledge. Uh, let's see if we can move things through. There we go. I also wanted to provide a recap. Yesterday, we had a very robust conversation and presentation from one of our researchers um, on different funding models. Um, and we also spent some time talking about our aspirations and our journey so far um, to build up to why IOI is announcing that we're launching a fund and what we hope to achieve with that. Um, our aims in this is to build upon the work that we have been doing over the past two and a half years uh, in terms of not only building a robust evidence base um, for this work, but also helping to coordinate conversations and understand some of those needs um, to really think about ways that a fund can, in much more structural way, catalyze and deepen investment in under-resourced areas um, and help also expressly fund needs that fall outside usual funding structures. We'll be talking more about that today with the funding framework as well. As well as diversify funding sources. Um, we heard in 
our day one uh, with the research from uh, Tanya Hernandez-Ortiz, our research data analyst, and Richard Dunks, our director of research and strategy, um, when they were looking at the various funders that are powering um, open infrastructure currently for this sector, about some of the needs for diversifying beyond those initial groups when it comes to cash grants and helping build that further resilience. And so our aims in helping to launch this fund are also in terms of increasing the investment and expanding the amount of um, sources of support that we are bringing together, including examining structural ways that we can um, pilot for industry players to contribute safely without undue influence um, to helping to reinvest in the open infrastructure space. And then lastly, but you know, certainly not least, help activate a mechanism for bold higher risk investments. Um, for those that are involved in this ecosystem, but also in adjacent open infrastructure ecosystems, you'll, you'll know that there are very strong competing market forces in terms of the acquisition of open infrastructure services, of um, the commoditization of those services. And so really thinking, where can we start to think about what the counterbalance to those effects are, whether that's a community buyback of infrastructure. So we're not caught on our sort of back heel, so to speak, when it comes to a, an offer from a big for-profit entity to buy and close off a piece of open infrastructure that's serving the research community, as well as uh, models for longer term sustaining funding for core services, um, and also building on solutions to address unmet needs. What are different ways that we can not only build on what is existing, but also address areas where we might need to develop new infrastructure solutions or collaborations and interoperability. For this fund to succeed, uh, and this brings us to some of the things that we spoke about yesterday around the co-budget experiment, which is um, the collective funding work that we're gonna be doing collectively uh, this week, um, really thinking about how we can get increased participation in how funding gets allocated and who gets invited to sit at that table. Um, you know, there's a lot of supporters of infrastructure in various ways, whether at philanthropies, private trusts, um, industry, as well as institutional stakeholders that are represented here today um, and over the course of this week. And recognizing that that work is you know, very beneficial in what it does, but also thinking about where we can further increase that participation, which is what we are looking to model uh, with using the co-budget platform. Um, and that learning to help factor into our broader design of the um, bigger collective fund that we're aiming to launch in early 2024, as well as looking at where more transparency, not only in terms of the funding trends, but also how money is allocated and how money is also used by projects, um, how that is used. And so also thinking through, um, and I know this was a question from yesterday, what representative governance looks like to counter the opacity and also traditional models that we see when we're looking at setting up funds where those that contribute often get a say in how that um, funding is allocated. We know that there are very um, interesting kind of research questions, but also practicalities when it comes to looking at bringing in, say, industry contributions to that space and not wanting to, again, exacerbate some of the problems that we're looking to set up, set ourselves apart from. And so for now, we're, sp we're speaking of that as sort of a community investment council, but also recognizing that that is an area of specific um, development and focus that we need to build upon. Also, the investment in coordination among funders and peer initiatives. Um, and we've started at the beginning of this calendar year um, quarterly calls to bring together individuals along those lines to help think about what it looks like to further a shared, not a competitive or duplicative agenda. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that work has factored into the development of our initial funding framework um, in just a few moments. And then lastly, the continued research and engagement to ensure that we are challenging our own assumptions uh, of 
you know, the space of money begets money and other sorts of elements that we know are really pervasive in how funding gets allocated to make sure that we are building evidence of what's needed, by whom, and how those needs can be best met so that we're not continuing to exacerbate some of the challenges that we know exist um, in how the infrastructure ecosystem is supported. The objectives for this session uh, so far, we've talked about why and how to fund. Today, we're gonna be exploring a bit more about what to fund. Um, we'll be sharing our funding framework and inviting your feedback. Um, we'll also be introducing what is open for funding in this week's co-budget pilot, which is we are utilizing participatory budgeting, as mentioned earlier, um, to really experiment with that transparency and democratization of who gets to participate in funding um, so that we can take those learnings and, again, have that influence and also um, serve as key information in our development of a broader collective fund for early 2024. And then we will also try collective funding. So stay tuned for that. Um, I wanted to recognize for the team today, our learning partner is Elena DeNaro from Greater Than. Uh, Elena, uh, if you could wave on the chat, who will be helping us capture some of our core learnings um, so that we can not only synthesize and share those back, but ensure that we are um, you know, keeping in, in mind some of those core and capturing some of those core nuggets as we move through this process. And um, tech support from the IOI team, Anne Britton and Jerry Salenga. If you have any questions, please feel free to um, message them, reach out in the Zoom chat, or if you're in the Funder Summit Slack channel, you can also tag them there. Okay, so without further ado, um, we're going to get into some of the elements that have led to how we start to think about prioritizing open infrastructure needs. Um, we refer to this as a funding, funding framework and um, wanted to note that since I joined IOI in March of 2020, this is in many ways um, probably one of the biggest, hairiest questions in terms of what IOI's thesis is for this work, knowing that there are a number of different initiatives that take a multitude of um, approaches to this. And that also helps build out additional capacity and additional support um, to, to serve these needs. But when we were thinking about what IOI's perspective for this work would be, again, thinking about, and we've talked about some of this over the course of this week, first identifying opportunities, um, but also funding and service gaps where there are key blockers. Um, in some spaces, we think of these as sort of counterfactuals. You know, what does it look like if a service stops running? Um, what support is needed? What is the impact? Um, but also prioritizing areas of need, um, coordinating with peers to assess how to address investment. And um, we spoke a little bit about that of what our future plans are for um, the fund that we're working towards, but also the ongoing efforts we have, not only with the open community engagement with our work, but also again, those quarterly collaborator calls where we bring together not only peer initiatives that are also funding in the space, but also funders of various stripes, institutional decision makers and others. And then finally, act in terms of piloting interventions, funding strategies, and recommendations. Um, for the course of this week, we are going to be looking at co-budget as the main place to drive that action, as well as um, in the in the next over the next year, really building out that collective funding pilot, as well as additional funding strategies and recommendations based on our research and analysis. I wanted to take a quick note, uh, a quick moment to, to just look back um, to the extensive work that what we're about to present builds upon. Um, in terms of the research that the team has built out and, and helping to, we talk about this foundation of evidence that we are, um, that we have been dedicated to building, um, you know, and sharing out with the community to help influence and better understand where we as IOI can be more, you know, effective and impactful if we were to move towards these sorts of funding mechanisms, but also in terms of providing that guidance to funders and decision makers about specific needs. And so, um, as you heard on Monday, uh, we had in our initial prototype 
of the Catalog of Open Infrastructure Services, um, 10 services uh, that we did deep research and also engagement and interviews for. Um, we also had 45 open infrastructure services that expressed interest in being included in the next release of the catalog. Um, we also interviewed 23 representatives from open infrastructure providers, funders, institutions, and institutional consortia um, on the cost of open infrastructure that fed into that work. That also built upon um, from 2020 and 2021, our Future of Open Scholarship work, which um, spanned 18 countries around the world uh, and had over 115 participants from a variety of different entities, uh, from institutions, funders, infrastructure providers, advocates, policymakers, and more to help identify needs, especially at the um, start of the pandemic where we were looking at core infrastructure and budgetary needs and where we could be most impactful. And so this also, um, especially in the development of the catalog of open infrastructure services, these deep um, interviews and pieces of research really were designed to help get a better understanding of where some of these gaps may exist and also to help understand where funding can be most effective and, and help direct that from the infrastructure provider's perspective, but also again, bringing in the funders and the institutional leaders that are making decisions about this work. Mm -hmm. oh, there we go. Um, in terms of the design questions, let me just make sure I did not, oh, I skipped a couple slides here. One second, here we go. Um, the other component that I know some of you may have seen if you've joined one of our recent collaborator calls um, or seen the blog post on uh, that is linked at the bottom, and we'll drop that link in the chat. The other um, aspect to note is, you know, we really, for this funding framework, started to think about what are the preconditions to helping uh, to make open infrastructure the default in research. Um, I know that some of those other blocks there are a little too hard to read, um, but really thinking about what assumptions are embedded in our conception of this aim, what interventions will help bring about this desired change, um, what's likely to work, what's been tried before. Um, we went through this exercise not only as a team and as and with our staff, with our steering committee and governance, as well as with the, those collaborators and other decision makers and peer initiatives um, to help get a better understanding of how we can start to, again, further that shared agenda. So as we go into this next phase, we're really gonna be focusing on this prioritization component. Um, we know that IOI can't Hand, we can't address all of the challenges in the space, right? That's not the point. That's not the aim. Um, we really do see ourselves as sitting alongside and in collaboration with, um, thank you, Robin, for putting that in the chat, um, in terms of sitting in collaboration with other efforts that are supporting the, the ecosystem as well. Um, and we're going to walk you through a little bit about how we've been thinking about this. Set. Let's see. Got a little bit of a lag in the slides. There we go. Um, so first off, some oh, there we go. <laughs> some design, uh, some design questions. It's almost like I'm at a real podium. Um, it's all you know. First off, to start with some of the design questions that we set out to, um, you know, with our with our frame for this this work. So first off, as we heard over the past few days, um, you know, we really wanted to deeply interrogate what's our position as IOI on funding specific technologies and service providers versus funding areas of development that might affect the conditions necessary for them to flourish. You know, again, keeping in mind, if we're going to move to make open infrastructure the default in research, what is the most effective way and, and where can we help amplify and um, address some of the gaps that are um, not currently being met by other funding mechanisms. And so some of these conditions you'll see in terms of governance, interoperability, accessibility, also adoption, really kind of put that to test. You know, again, we wanna make sure that we are, of course, supporting the projects that um, are heavily relied on, but also recognizing that um, in some cases, just allocating more, increasing the amount of funding that goes to a set of projects 
doesn't necessarily mean that they will become the default in research or that adoption will follow. And so taking that um, holistic approach and really um, challenging those base assumptions, thinking about what that mix looks like, as well as what context is needed to best understand existing funder needs for projects and funding needs for projects. Um, we talked a lot about um, the frame of context, but really thinking about, for example, what for a specific community might be seen as core infrastructure might not necessarily transcend to uh, and translate to what another community with metrics they are looking at. I'll give an example here, um, Makutu, which is a, a content management system specifically for indigenous scholars. Um, you know, for that scale or numbers of users is not necessarily the best indicator of success or growth or service, right? In the same sort of way that you might be looking at a repository that is maybe available in a, a more global um, a global stage um, or a more general repository. And so again, making sure that we're keeping in mind that context. And then also thinking uh, about what we are looking to enable. I think many of these conversations are around what is not, uh, you know, not currently funded, um, but really thinking what's that state change that we're looking at, you know, what's needed to help further the growth, adoption, and interdependence of open infrastructure to really make it a healthier ecosystem and one that is more um, reliable and robust. So in terms of our frames and this, um, you know, some of you that have taken a look at the co-budget platform got a sneak peek at some of this differentiation. Um, you know, we, in terms of how we are looking at identifying these core areas of investigation, um, we like to think of those in terms of causes and also conditions. Um, causes being those top line areas of investigation around a certain problem or opportunity area. This is often categories or types of infrastructure, such as preprints, which Naomi will be sharing more about um, later today, repositories, persistent identifiers, standards. Um, and in addition to that, also thinking about those cross-cutting dimensions that we believe are necessary considerations to improve the health, growth, and adoption of open infrastructure. These areas um, from our research and you know, our deep kind of in their interactions with the broader community and also service providers um, are often under-resourced or underserved by conventional funding models. Um, we hear from projects that they don't know that they can prioritize certain um, aspects of strategic growth, um, but also include items such as governance, embeddedness um, and adoption, interoperability, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And so just to note, and I have refrained from kind of putting a visual on here, but you think of causes as sort of the deeper dive into specific um, buckets of, or specific areas or categories of infrastructure, and then conditions as those elements that we see operating across. In addition to that, um, one of the main things that we wrestled with as a team uh, was, you know, we, I think we've all seen the either the research lifecycle or the tools across. And I know um, there's a number of individuals who've joined us over the course of this summit who've done some really foundational work in terms of mapping what those research tools cycles look like, whether it's around analysis infrastructure or um, publishing, archival, um, dissemination, communication of research, but really thinking about, you know, do we aim to serve all of those areas? Do we aim to serve a specific area? How, how can we, again, get to that prioritization? And so um, how we're looking at this in terms of identifying causes are also adding a couple different um, components to um, to that dimensionality of how we make these decisions. And so in addition to thinking about where we are seeing, you know, current action or where there might be um, trends or, you know, movement in the broader community, and again, our community engagement and work with stakeholder groups help surface some of these ideas, as well as our research team doing that. Um, but also thinking about how relied upon are these specific infrastructure areas um, by the research community. Again, noting that this may vary depending on the size of the community served in uniqueness, Makutu being that example that I cited earlier. Also thinking, is there a heightened risk of commercialization 
and or switching to a closed model. Um, one of the main reasons that I know Naomi will dig into uh, later today in the preprint session of uh, focusing on preprints initially was, you know, initial conversations from 2020 and 2021 by our governance body of, you know, if some of the core preprint servers were bought out by some of the big publishers, really what 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 would the opportunity be there? What would, you know, what would fill that space? And so again, factoring in that level of risk and those market forces. Are there limited alternatives, both commercial and not-for-profit? Again, if a service were to say either shut down due to change in funding, um, pivot in a certain sort of way that might leave the space um, less uh, less well served, um, or you know, be acquired. What does that alternative space look like? Are there viable alternatives? And then also, are there financial and or organizational concerns affecting the runway and ongoing viability? And again, these are areas we know that there are significant amounts of different infrastructure um, areas that we could be looking at. And so again, thinking through how we start to bubble up what we kind of do those deeper dives in um, initially here and also make sure we're engaging with the community on that too. And then to the conditions component. This is where, uh, again, from that theory of change, as well as the research uh, that was funded by the Mellon Foundation and Arcadia um, in terms of building out the catalog of open infrastructure services and understanding costs and needs for infrastructure projects. These are areas that have been surfaced um, in, a, in, in, light of that, in light of that work and so when we start to think about where targeted investment may be able to, again, help address some of the things that are either leading to, you know, less adoption, less reach, less um, permanence within the broader ecosystem, we like to flag um, accessibility and affordability. Um, this could be research into bandwidth and connectivity limitations for services. We know in certain areas of the world that heavily rely on mobile access that even some of the open access publishing solutions are um, very difficult to use um, based on how those are, how those are crafted. Translation also, being able to work in your native language, um, as well as inclusive cost structures is just some of the ideas there. Second, reliability and delivery of services. This is you know, support for technical development, ongoing maintenance support, possibly addressing technical debt. Some projects that have existed for 20 to 30 years have a significant amount of technical debt um, that we've encountered. Um, understanding the reliability on core dependencies and where that might make for a service to be more fragile um, than others. Then also thinking about interoperability and interdependence. So this gets into some of the persistent identifiers in the space, development of standards and protocols to help enable the exchange of information, um, discoverability, as well as funds, thinking creatively about where we can use funds to incentivize collaboration and integration across services. Um, for those in the scholarly communication space, the Next Generation Library Publishing Project did this really well, in my opinion, in terms of using funding and support to catalyze building bridges across three core offerings in the infrastructure space. Additionally, looking at the question of embeddedness and adoption. We often get the question of, okay, if you were to increase the amount of funding for infrastructure, does that is that enough to get an institution to switch away from their for-profit stack to um, an open solution? So thinking about um, where we can dedicate targeted support for say local organizations um, and capacity building, training efforts, financial incentives for migration and adoption costs to move away from extractive services, or even to converge on, say, one open infrastructure service. Um, consortial or national research and education network support to help expand reach and availability, again, utilizing the deep relationships we have with existing networks that provide IT support or um, high-performance computing support to institutions worldwide. 
And then lastly, in terms of oversight and accountability, um, for those of you who've worked, have been paying attention to IOI's work, you'll hear more about this. We really, really believe in governance. Um, and so thinking about where financial support um, for building intentional representative governance can uh, be directed towards projects. So it's not an afterthought or something that is in competition with delivery of a service, but there's adequate resourcing for that, as well as building out financial oversight mechanisms, evaluative mechanisms to help assess project towards uh, or progress towards operational maturity, support for documentation, longer term planning and stewardship. And so these are just a couple of um, of the areas and this gets into where we wanted to test this out in the co-budget um, platform for this week and really to give you a better sense as to um, where some of those conditions and causes have come from. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Naomi who's going to do uh, a bit more in terms of digging into what this looks like for the rest of the week. Naomi over to you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I'm just going to grab control of the slides. Excellent. Deep, deep breath. Thank you so much for taking us through the framework there, Caitlin. Um, so we're just going to spend maybe 10 to 15 minutes now um, thinking about those six areas of need that we've prioritized to look at this week. Um, so these are areas of need that we've prioritized based on conversations and research, as Caitlin has just gone through. Um, and uh, so these are the titles that you'll see. So if you've seen already in the co-budget platform um, or on our schedule for the deep dives, we're using these topic words, adoption, community governance, criticality and at-riskness, financial health, technical reliability and security, and preprints infrastructure. You'll note that five of these are about cross-cutting conditions uh, for open infrastructure to flourish. And one is one of these cause areas, and um, as Caitlin put it, one that's at heightened risk of commercialization, for example. I'm gonna take you through each of these one by one now, just so you can see um, where we're at with understanding these particular areas um, and some of our thoughts about what funds could be, uh, how funds could be spent if we prioritize any of these areas for investment with our collective fund this week. Okay, so looking at adoption first, this is the last deep dive tomorrow, um, so uh, please do come along to a workshop that Emmy's going to facilitate, uh, we, we're going to talk about this together. To us, the challenge here is that to make open infrastructure the default in research, we need to raise awareness for these open infrastructure services and build capacity around their use to ultimately increase their adoption. So from our conversations and research, we have heard that decision makers and users often find it challenging to discover these open infrastructure services. They also struggle to choose to adopt a fledgling open service when in comparison, there may be an established reputable commercial service available to them. So if this area were to receive um, some funds, maybe you know somewhere between 30 and 50,000 US dollars, which is what could be possible this week, uh, we have some preliminary suggestions uh, about what we could use those funds for. Uh, for all of these areas, these are preliminary suggestions that come from research recommendations, um, but there's also the opportunity in all of the deep dives to suggest your own ideas and suggestions, and none of these are firm or committed to at this point. So after this week, this is where we'd go back and, and uh, help, help us all work out how to administer the funds and to what. So please come to those deep dives uh, to suggest your own ideas here. but. For adoption, here's some ideas that we had. So the, we could use funds for grants to support individual open infra infrastructure services to develop marketing plans and materials to raise awareness and or training materials and programs so that people can build that capacity and learn how to use, use those services. We could also use funds for grants to support local initiatives to develop community engagement and programs that increase the adoption of open infrastructure in their communities. And finally, we could use the funds for capacity building grants for institutions to explore, adopt and contribute to open alternatives for a commercial service that they currently use. And also to assess migration needs to help that move away from the commercial service. Okay, so looking at community governance, the challenge we see here, which will be talked about more later today uh, in the deep dive, is that for effect 
that sorry for um the challenges that effective and meaningful governance is something that we really see as a keystone for viable and sustainable open infrastructure as caitlin mentioned however these governance structures and processes are often seen as additional hurdles for organizations who are looking to simply get things done within the capacity that they have and perhaps they're seen as distractions furthermore there's no one right way to structure governance these organizations we here need capacity and knowledge to be able to choose a suitable model depending on their specific internal factors and external environment. So we could use funds to support grants for individual organisations so that they can engage consultants and experts and or convene committees or working groups with stakeholders and evaluate existing governance and develop plans to further decentralise their decision making. We could also use funds uh, to, to grant to individual organizations for capacity building and resourcing so they can improve the transparency of their governance, their participation in their governance, and also the meaningful functioning of their community governance mechanisms. And finally, they could we could use funds as a community to create knowledge such as a playbook or a set of case studies to really explore what's needed to build a minimal viable system of community governance. Okay, thirdly, we have critical and at-risk infrastructure. So the challenge here is that infrastructure often can go unnoticed until there's a disruption in service. Um, in recent years, we've seen both for and non-profit infrastructure offerings that are heavily relied on in the research and scholarly ecosystem struggle to maintain stable funding. Um, and in many cases, they get purchased by for-profit entities. So this poses an ongoing risk that infrastructure services that are really heavily utilized by the research and scholarly community may be sold to the highest bidder or closed due to the lack of funding. And that's something that we wish to avoid. If this area gets funded this week, some ideas for how we could use the funds include as bridge, bridge funding for open infrastructure services that are in need of continuation support when their own funding sources or previous sources have been disrupted. They could be emergency funds that could be used for unplanned contingencies, such as those that present an existential threat to their organization. They could be funds for legal expertise to develop organizational structures that help nonprofit organizations thrive despite the threats from for profit commercial providers. And finally, they could, these funds could be used to host convenings to discuss a community buyback strategy for countering offers from for profit entities to buy and enclose infrastructure that serves research and scholarship. So, four different ideas there, but you can suggest your own ideas as well if you come along. That's tomorrow, that deep dive. Thanks for answering that question as well, Caitlin. Okay, so financial health. So our colleague Tanya will be speaking about this later today, but as a preview, the challenge from our assessment of the financial health of 18 nonprofits in the research and scholarship sector, we found that many of these nonprofits tend to over rely on a single type of revenue, have insufficient cash on hand for contingencies and have excessive liabilities relative to their available assets. We also see they underinvest in human resources and other important operational expenses. This increases these nonprofits' vulnerability to external financial fluctuations, which we've seen a lot of recently, and limits their ability to build up critical operating reserves. All of this can be problematic for the long term sustainability of nonprofit organizations that are providing essential services to research and scholarship intentionally for the long term. So what can we do here? Well, with some funds, the first few actions that could be taken include creating resources and training materials that really help people to work out how to reduce their liabilities, manage costs and increase revenue. They could also help guide fundraise, fundraising. We could be hosting funder convenings to explore the use of shared services to spread the costs between nonprofits for some of the essential operations um, and other factors that really help them to to build financial literacy and um, and train them train up um, to be able to maintain the financial health and well-being of their organization. And thirdly, these funds could be capacity building grants to support financial planning, fundraising and portfolio diversification efforts um, through accessing consultancy or planning services. 
Okay. The fifth one on the list, and the last of these cross-cutting conditions, is to do with technical reliability and security. So open source provides fast flexibility for developers and engineers to build on each other's work and innovate faster in response to communities' needs. And it's one of those key uh, principles of open source infrastructure, of open scholarly infrastructure. Um, it creates an ecosystem of open technologies that are mutually dependent on each other. However, many of these open source projects suffer from being underinvested in, and it's a struggle to maintain the infrastructure. We heard this earlier this week from people. Um, so not only is it a struggle to maintain the infrastructure, it's also a struggle for maintaining community development, um, even when the community is well established. And overall, they accumulate some technical debt. This leads to increased vulnerability across the open source ecosystem. So what could we use funds for here? Again, some more capacity building grants, which could go to individual open infrastructure services so they can develop great awareness of their risk uh, in terms of technical and human infrastructure and develop some mitigation strategies. It could be, these funds could be used for a collective uh, development of a risk monitoring system so we can assess dependencies, health and other issues and guide decision-making for the ecosystem at large. And finally, they could be used for financial support to manage labor and ongoing maintenance costs for open source infrastructure. And lastly, preprints infrastructure. So this one I'll speak about more in the next deep, deep dive that follows shortly after this session. To give you a preview of that, uh, the challenge we see here um, is that preprints, they provide rapid, rapid access to research outputs. They help support more equitable participation in scholarship. And they have been a valuable space for experimenting with scholarly communications, how we share and review scholarly outputs. However, this ecosystem is not yet financially sustainable. Uh, most preprints are not shared or reviewed using open infrastructure and existing academic led preprint servers face significant risk from com competition from for profit commercial publisher specific and other propriety solutions. So some ideas for what we could use funds for here. Uh, they could be used for planning grant support for existing preprint services so they can investigate the technical requirements and explore the feasibility of switching to existing open source solutions for their services. They could be used to convene a design workshop to generate new ideas for financing models to sustain open preprint services and or support the testing of these models without disrupting existing services. Uh, and finally, they could be used for hosting convenings to support preprint services and initiatives to improve equitable participation, sorry about that, uh, and or grants directly to community leads from underserved groups so they can start or maintain their initiatives that support productive adop adoption of preprints in their communities. Okay, so those are the six areas of need that we're talking about this week when we talk about co-budget and the participatory budgeting uh, pilot that we're, we're running together with you. So just as a quick recap, we have $130,000 committed by IOI, University at Buffalo and Simons Foundation, which we'll be sharing equally amongst all the people who've signed up um, to be allocated funds. Uh, so this is like very literally sharing the power of decision-making. You will get an individual budget to, to vote with your feet. Um, and by voting with the funds that you get on this platform, you're basically signaling which areas you think should be prioritized. Um, so the uh, the funds will stay on the platform. So they're basically a, a voting tool um, and you don't have to allocate them all at once. You'll get, a, you'll get, we don't really know how much yet because it depends on how many people in the platform, but maybe a few thousand dollars. You could try a little at first, but make sure that you've allocated all your funds by the deadline of 10 a.m. on Friday. Um, so, okay, so we have had some questions about what specifically would be, be funding. I hope that the ideas and suggestions that I've just gone through help to articulate the kind of level of projects that we see uh, might be feasible for receiving some of these funds. But again, these aren't determined yet and more conversation will follow after this week. Um, what we're doing this week is focusing on the process and trying out this process, exploring together how this kind of participatory funding mechanism works. The money is real and these areas of need are very real. Um, so we'll be looking for the areas that receive the highest amount of funds and we'll be prioritizing moving those particular conversations forward. Um, so please put your dollars where you are really excited to further explore or think that that additional investment and funding is really critical. 
Um, at the end of the week, we'll be sharing a synthesis on the feedback that we've had and the allocations that have been put in by Friday. And we'll be sharing more about next steps on how these funds will be allocated and administered. Um, there's lots of opportunity to, for you to provide that feedback. You can use the shared documents from the deep dive sessions, whether you're there live or whether you want to review those documents after those sessions, we'll be sharing those links in the recap email um, so that you, they will be accessible to you. So please feel free to comment and add, add thoughts. You can also use the commenting function on the co-budget platform to add your thoughts on each of the areas pages. Um, and you might be suggesting projects that you want to advocate for, ways that you want to see these funds otherwise allocated, and any other specific needs that come to mind. So we've expressed a challenge based on our research so far, but you, there may be other aspects of the challenge that you wish to raise. Okay, taking a pause here and just seeing in the chat. There's a couple of questions I wonder We've got some time after a quick exercise to take these questions at the end. Caitlin is nodding. I won't pause here. That's good. <laughs> okay, so what we wanted to do before we head into some discussion spaces together is just to give you a quick chance to try out collective funding um, yourself. So um, we're going to enter an imaginary space and I hope you come with us. It's going to take about five minutes and I hope it's fun. Uh, but this, this participatory budgeting uh, mechanism uh, Caitlin was talking about this yesterday. It's It's been around for decades. I think one of the really prominent case studies was Porto Alegre in, in Brazil, and it's typically been used for sharing the power with the civic budget. It may not be the whole, city, so, whole amount of a city's budget, for example, but sometimes uh, a city or an area might have give 10% of their budget um, to a, an exercise where the citizens can, can decide what to spend that budget on. So we're going to try that together now. So if we were collectively in charge of a city's budget, how would we spend those funds to improve the city we live in? And if there's anyone here who's ever actually taken part in one of these exercises, it would be great to hear from you in the chat as well. You may have done it locally. But for now, we're in imaginary shared city together. Um, and the aim that we all share is to make our city more environmentally friendly. Um, you might notice this is Hobbiton. Um, if anyone's been before, <laughs> let's just imagine we're there. <laughs> Um, the, the city of Hobbiton has invited us all to help decide how to spend our city's annual budget. So how can we make our city more environmentally friendly? Well, a process has already happened to suggest ideas uh, for this pot. And what we're going to do is we're going to have $300 each of the city's budget to allocate towards the project ideas that have already been suggested. They are create an insect hotel, add solar panels, provide a more environmentally friendly menu, run a carbon neutral music festival to raise awareness, get national park status for a local peatland, or something else. Maybe you don't like any of those ideas, you can fund an exercise to collect some more. Okay. Emmy. Okay, so thank you very much for your participation there. It was just a bit of fun, but I, and, it, and just a bit quick, but I hope it really inspires you. If you're on the co-budget platform or you're yet to join, you can really do this for open infrastructure areas uh, in the next couple of days. Okay, so we've done a lot of talking now, Caitlin and I, <laughs> and now it's time to give you space to talk with us. So um, I'm going to spend five minutes on some, some logistics so that if anyone needs to leave, you, you're welcome to leave after those logistics points. Um, but we're also going to be here to use up the rest of our time together, the next 20, 30 minutes, um, in discussion spaces. Uh, so those discussion spaces, we have preempted that you might want to speak about code budget. So please feel free to come to that breakout room if that interests you. Um, if you're struggling to know which sessions to come to next, which deep dives to attend, or you just want to ask further questions about this week's summit and the schedule, please make your way to the wayfinding room. We'll also have an open discussion room for any additional thoughts you'd like to share with the team, broader questions about what's going on and what we've been talking about so far. Please feel free to go to that discussion room. And you may, we've preempted these, but you may have other things you want to talk and you maybe you want to talk with others here uh, and not with that, the IOI team. So please feel free to also type into the Zoom chat if there are any additional rooms that you'd like us to make for discussions. And I'll spend five minutes now on some logistics, so you've got a bit of time to think. So what is happening next? Well, very shortly, in about an hour, um, I'll be taking you into a deeper dive into preprints infrastructure. 
Um, then following that, we've got Raven Klein and Samuel Moore, um, our research affiliates, who will be taking you through good community governance and the research that they've done into that. And finally, finishing off today, we've got our colleague Tanya Hernandez Ortiz, who's going to be speaking about her research into the financial health and risks of nonprofits in this space. Um, please come to those sessions if you want to hear about the research we've been doing and also be part of discussions to think about ideas for what we can do to improve um, and really build on what we've already got there in open infrastructure. Tomorrow's deep dives look a little different. We'll be welcoming panelists from many different organisations. Um, pretty excited about these, actually. Um, uh, and we'll be discussing some of the areas where we may not have done uh, those dedicated research projects to report out, but instead what we'll be looking at together are some key critical questions in these areas, these challenge areas that we have prioritised, looking at criticality and at riskness, followed by technical reliability and security, and finally finishing in a workshop with you uh, to look at how we help support adoption of open infrastructure services. After those deep dives, we'll have another set of hands-on workshops. Thank you to those who've come uh, either earlier today um, or last night to the hands-on sessions uh, about setting up your participation in the co-budget pilot this week. The next round of hands-on sessions will be helping you to allocate funds on co-budget, discussing with your peers, and also a space to learn and reflect each other. So as a, a, once again, we're prioritizing understanding the process this week um, and trying to work out what's it like to do this transparently? What's it like to do this with the level of information we have? How does it feel to share out that budget together? So please come along to those either of those time zone sessions um, uh, where we'll be joined again by um, our partners with Greater Than, Ellen is on the call today, uh, who will help us work through that process. So that's how it all sits within our schedule. You'll see we're on the Wednesday right now and about to go into these deep dives. Um, some, some timelines to really note for you. Um, eight o'clock uh, this evening, Greenwich Mean Time. Um, so maybe 1 p.m. Pacific and quick maths, 4 p.m. Uh, New York. Um, that's your deadline to join co-budget. If you want to receive funds to allocate in this participatory budgeting exercise, you must join by then because we need to know how many people to split the pot equally between. Uh, some members of the IOI team will also be there with you. Um, we also know that people uh, have joined the platform already and that's fantastic. But through hearing about what this, this co-budget pilot is this week, you may have decided maybe it's not comfortable for you to take part in this week's pilot. And that's absolutely fine. If that is the case and you've joined the platform already, please could you let us know? Because what we'll do is we'll make sure we don't allocate funds to you. We want to make sure that when we split the pot, we're splitting it between people who are able to go ahead and use those funds in the next couple of days with us in this exercise. Um, there's no harm done to have joined and to tell us that you don't want to participate anymore. Absolutely fine. Please just let us know. I think you can use the Slack channel. You can email Emmy. Sorry, Emmy. <laughs> you can say in Zoom chat right now. Uh, just, just let either Emmy or myself know, and we'll be we'll be able to manage that. Thank you so much. Um, great. Okay, so once you are on the co-budget platform, the final deadline is that 10 a.m., 10 o'clock in the morning, Greenwich Mean Time on Friday, November the fourth, or basically by the time you go to bed, if you're in U.S. time zones on Thursday, you please need to have allocated your funds by then. You don't have to do it all at once. Uh, but please make sure you've done your whole pot if you plan to by that point, because we'll be then looking at the results and, and sharing those results live in our first session on Friday, which is the closing session of the summit. OK. Um, so before we're heading to discussion rooms, we just want to see where you're at. So if you could just take one minute now, we're going to ask you to type into the Zoom chat, but don't press go until we say go. We want to do one of these chatterfuls again so we can all see where everyone is at. Um, and our prompt for today is please share something you've learned about collective funding. <laughs> 